In this unit, we'll look at women during the Enlightenment, shifting from the Renaissance, where we see a, the beginning of humanism and knowledge being spread as a replacement for religion. And the role of women does change somewhat and that they do take more agency in gaining knowledge and disseminating knowledge among other women. Um, until this point, the status and representation of women for the majority of Western history was oppressive and restrictive. For thousands of years, we saw women enjoying very few economic, legal, or political rights. And in theory, they were expected to be submissive to their fathers or husbands. Uh, they confined to traditional gender roles, which forced them to remain in domestic and private spheres and societies. Um, their roles as daughters, wife, and mother were considered the most significant function in society, the, the pinnacle of achievement for a woman. For elite members of society, the reproductive capabilities of women were an extremely important function in determining inheritances and maintaining the family line. Through all classes of society, the social system of patriarchy evolved as the primary way to regulate women's behavior and maintain social control. During the Renaissance from about 1400 to 1600 um, and into the 18th century, which we look at as the age of enlightenment, Women were consistently considered to be inferior to men and their role in society continued to be primarily domestic. However, the representation of and attitude toward women started to gradually improve, particularly through the medium of literature. During the Enlightenment, women began to take advantage of new intellectual trends such as the novel and the salon these social outlets enabled them to have a more public voice. And furthermore, the Enlightenment, although it continued to promote strict gender roles in general, some saw the first signs of feminism through the writings of figures such as British writer Mary Wollstonecraft, who we'll look at later in this lecture. During the Enlightenment, the development of ideas like individualism and rationality started to challenge women's relegated role in society. Writers such as Diderot and Rousseau wrote about this, but continued to separate women as the opposites of men. Women were still perceived to have des designated roles in society, particularly as mothers and wives. Diderot is the author of the Encyclopedia, which many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Um, he published a lot of articles, a lot of writings, a lot of theories, um, mostly about men and, and their roles in society. His articles that dealt with women often emphasized their physical weakness and inferiority, and he usually attributed administration or childbirth as a, a reason why that women were so weak. Whereas in the ancient world, if you recall, when we were looking at cave uh, paintings and society during the Stone Age, um, the idea that women bled monthly and did not die was something that was celebrated and led to a matriarchal culture. Now that's been turned on its head. The fact that women bleed every month makes them inferior and weak. Women were reared to be frivolous and unconcerned with important issues. Motherhood was the most important occupation. Uh, there was a double standard on uh, sexual behavior where men were seen as needing outlets other than their wives. Uh, women were seen as n not needing at all, only there to fulfill a man's needs. That double standard continues. Uh, overall, the contributors to the uh, encyclopedia and all of the other writings during this time, the male contributors disagreed on the social equality of women. It was debated, it went around and around with debates, um, but then the formal writings of the period, women are always seen as the inferior 
component. Some of the ways in which women were able to at least have some perception of their usefulness outside of uh, their ability to serve a man's needs were because uh, during the Enlightenment, we start seeing notions of rationalism and tolerance. Uh, people started thinking about what a just society is and how justice should be served and who plays what role in society um, and being more tolerant about differences, different abilities and different roles and even people playing different roles than they had for centuries past. So you see a bit of this um, move toward a rational type of thinking and, and valuing other members of society that had been devalued previously. Another way feminism began to gain momentum, uh, and this, as we said, was some of the first uh, feminists that we we see that we would actually term feminists, um, is because of print culture. Now that printing was available and prints were disseminated widely, there are daily newspapers and caricatures. Women could uh, use this as a tool to disseminate ideas so that it wasn't just one woman thinking, why am I here? Am I set in this lot in my life? They were able to find out that there were other women who felt the same way. And this print culture enabled women to share ideas and thoughts and find each other and get together collectively. And, and when you do have that ability, then you have some power. So there is where we gain some momentum during this period. We'll take a brief look at over the next few slides at uh, Rousseau's book, Emile, written in 1762. Uh, it's Rousseau's major uh, statement on philosophy. It's a series of five books that uh, outline the philosophy of education, um, a, a groundbreaking work in educational reform. And in it, he talks about the difference in the sexes and how they sh should be educated. And he believes that any formal education, whether in a school atmosphere or a religious atmosphere, should not be started until adolescence. And um, that was a radical suggestion at the time because well-bred children were expected to begin religious training in particular by the age of six or seven. So this is a book that goes against all the traditions of the time regarding education, but yet it still embraces some very unequal ideas about uh, the education of women. So he writes about how men, in this book about how men and women occupy separate spheres, as though that is just the way it way it is and the way it was intended. Worldly sphere for men, domestic sphere for women. Uh, men, uh, in the union of the sexes, each alike contributes to the common end, but in different ways. From this diversity springs the first difference, which must be observed between man and woman in their moral relations. The man should be strong and active. The woman should be weak and passive. The one must have both the power and the will. It is enough that the other should offer little resistance. Please take the time to read the quotes over the next few slides. They will be very enlightening for you regarding Rousseau's attitude toward women. We'll look at both 
writers and artists, visual artists during this period. And we'll start out with some visual artists. First, we'll look at Angelica Kaufman, which many of you may have heard of. She was a neoclassical painter, painting at the same time as uh, Jacques-Louis David, who we see as the major standout neoclassical artist. Um, she trained in Italy. She was uh, had a career in London and Rome, one of two founding members of the Royal Academy in London in 1768. Um, she had equitable friendships in Florence and Rome with major figures in European culture, such as Goethe, Winckelmann, Benjamin West, Nathaniel Dance, Sir Joshua Reynolds, all of the men who make up the whole of European high society and culture and education at the time. Uh, she was an artist who painted, as I said, in the neoclassical style and tradition. So she focused on history painting. Um, history painting is the highest form of academic art, and it's where you focus on scenes from history or mythology, literature, scripture, and it required extensive knowledge. You had to know, uh, you had to have studied the Bible. You have to have learned classical literature. You had to have knowledge of art theory and practical training that included the study of anatomy of the male nude, um, which is something most women were denied access to, especially the opportunity to draw from nude models. Yet Kaufman managed to cross the gender boundary to acquire the necessary skill to build a reputation as a successful history painter who was admired by colleagues and eagerly sought by patrons. Her art was uh, on par with any of the male artists at the time. She's one of those rare women we discussed earlier in the course who has access to the things that other women don't have access to. Think about Linda Nochlin's article, why have there been no great women artists? Um, because they, they didn't have access to the world in which great artists emerged from. So Angelica Kaufman came from a wealthy family. She had educated members of her family who supported her and enabled her to uh, get into these societies. But once she was in there, she held her own and she made her own way, forged her own path. So it wasn't just because uh, she had access. She had talent, she had knowledge, she had all of these things. But as the circle goes, Despite all of that, had it not been her wealthy family, she would have had nothing. So she is the exception, not the rule, to women artists. The next few slides will give you images, examples of paintings that Kaufman painted. Another uh, woman who was able to make it as an artist during this time was Adelaide Le Bierguillard, and she is portrayed here in a self-portrait with two of her students in 1785. She was a French miniaturist and portrait painter uh, who studied with Georges de la Tour, and she was admitted to the French Academy, one of only four women who were admitted by this point. She was a very successful court painter, meaning Louis the 16th hired her, uh, patronized her, and brought her to into court society and court life as an artist, not as a woman who would submit to his will. So she was known as the Pientre de Madame. She would paint the women's portraits, the high society women's portraits. Um, she established her own studio in this early 1780s and only took on female students. Um, that's a great thing, but also a default thing because not many male art students would take learning under a female very seriously. Uh, wouldn't do anything to benefit their career. But she had her own studio that was unheard of at this point. She was teaching, she was instructing students uh, uh, in how to gain the knowledge and use that knowledge in painting. 
So the commissions that she received were mostly royal and aristocratic, and uh, this helped propel her career. It helped she could make a living as an artist. Um, she exhibited portraits at the Salon until 1800, which was just unheard of that the Salon actually accepted her works. Granted, they accepted portraits. Um, it, women could do portraits, landscapes, the smaller, lower level stuff. When you get up to the higher scale, like history painting, that was that was harder to get into. It was still seen as a man's world. These are some examples of the society portraits that Guillard painted. Uh, you can see the most well-known women of French society at the time. Everyone sought her out to have their portrait painted. And she painted in this sort of frilly, almost Rococo style, uh, but made each woman look absolutely their best. Later in the lecture, we'll look at the salons where women gathered uh, a different kind of salon, not the high art salon but the um, of the French Academy, but salons where small gatherings of women to support one another and propel each other in writing and arts and other disciplines. Uh, but here we see a, um, a painting of the atelier or, uh, type of salon, but for artists. Um, a workshop of Madame Vincent, 1808, and this is a painting of Guillard, uh, painted by her pupil Marie Capet in 1808. So you can see uh, by the end of her career, uh, even all the men were there. They were part of it. They were supporting her. It was she was just accepted as part of of this educated elite society. Elizabeth Viget Le Brun was an artist of the Rococo neoclassical style as well. She was Queen Marie Antoinette's favorite portrait painter. You see here a self portrait around the 1780s. Uh, she had fled Rome uh, just at the beginning of the revolution, the French Revolution in 1789, and while she was out of uh, the country. She worked in Italy, Austria, Russia, England, um, all over and really made a name for herself. She returned to Paris in 1805 and uh, continued working and became one of the most recognized painters, uh, especially of the, out of the women, uh, all across Europe at this time. She was known as one of the, the most important painters. She was self-taught which is also remarkable. She did not have access to the training in art schools, but when she went to Italy, uh, she was going to the museums and copying the old masters, um, especially Peter Paul Rubens. She would follow his technique of using layers of brilliant color um, to make this very lively, animated, polished um, technique that really lent itself to making very attractive portraits of that she used for the European royalty and aristocracy. So again, she achieved a level where she could support herself painting and um, received enough money from these high level commissions. So she continued traveling all over Europe and painting and, and made quite a name for herself during this time. And the next few images, I'll just let you look at some of the portraits she made. One thing she did always continue was uh, her own self-portrait in the domestic sphere, uh, self-portraits of her with her daughters. And you can see here her daughter at different ages. And um, they're very tender and affectionate. They're also in a slightly different style. The one on the left is a little more Rococo. The one on the right, a little more neoclassical. Um, but they're very tender, loving uh, images between a mother and child painted by the artist herself. So she's conveying her own emotion in these images.
The other type of meeting was a salon. It was another forum. Uh, these salons were held all over Europe, originated in the 16th century, um, where visitors had polite and witty conversation and refreshments were served. But in these enlightenment salons, pleasure was not the object objective. Women were not just there to be decorative and make witty conversation. Um, these famous hosts known as Salonis, like uh, Louise d'Epinay and Madame Gerfran and others, um, they used the salon as uh, an informal university. Uh, they were there to ex have the free exchange of ideas, read their own works, hear the works of other other women and um, listen to other ideas from intellectual scholars and scientists. The main purpose of the salons of Paris were for the salonniere during the Enlightenment was to satisfy the self-determined educational needs of women who started them. And that's a very important aspect that you'll want to keep in mind. These women were self-determined. They wanted to know more. They wanted to learn and be educated. And this was the socially acceptable substitute for the formal education that was denied them in, in regular society. So this was a very important part of their lives. The next two slides will just give you a look at some of the rooms they gathered in uh, this a Salon Bleu, a, a blue room, and on the next one, a yellow Salon Jean, the rooms that they would gather in um, and uh, talk about enlightening things. One of the most well-known salons was uh, Madame Geoffrin's salons, and here you can see outside her house where she had her, uh, there's a plaque now indicating where she had her salons, where they were held at her home, and a portrait of her here. It's a painting of one of her salons. So here you get an idea of what the salons looked like. It was um, not just women. That's the most fascinating thing. It was men and women gathering together, seeing each other as equals. And in this way, women could learn the information that the men had been able to go to school to acquire and thus have an informal university education. These salon gatherings really propelled this uh, enlightenment idea of tolerance and extended it to women um, so that they were not only tolerated, but valued. And men were able to see that women could not only understand the, the theories and philosophies that were being discussed, but they could also uh, analyze them and further the further them. They could apply them in their writings. They could uh, actually philosophize themselves and create their own theories based on their knowledge of, that they gained during these salon gatherings. Another notable woman during this period is the Madame or Marquise de Pompadour. Uh, Madame de Pompadour started life from a bourgeois family and ended up marrying a, another very wealthy man who together they were holding salons and Voltaire was coming along with Rousseau and other the major male philosophers of the time. Uh, but she caught the eye of the king of Louis the Fifteenth of France and he brought her to Versailles to be his mistress. While she was there, she became more than his mistress uh, because she always had his ear. She helped uh, run the government. It's well documented. Uh, it was suspected at the time, documented, eventually known today. Um, first, we'll talk about her influence on the arts. Uh, she was a very strong patron of writing and uh, painting and architecture and porcelain and 
the finer things of French life. She wanted to make French life uh, more full and enjoyable. And so she promoted the uh, production of luxury goods uh, and paid for them. Some of the most beautiful things we have from this period were uh, projects that she commissioned. And she uh, had one of the largest libraries in Europe at the time. She had several thousand books um, that had been given to her by Voltaire and um, that she kept there at the palace. And uh, she had read most of these books. She was an avid reader. She therefore had the knowledge of world affairs and the training of a, a classical uh, knowledge and republic and society. So she was a very astute observer of the political engagement during this period and was able to uh, later in their lives in the 1750s um, help guide France when they were on verge of war with England. She was um, played a major role in influencing what became the Diplomatic Revolution, a treaty that allied France with Austria, who had been their former enemy. So the two signed a treaty on May 1st, 1756, that it, but it eventually led to the Seven Years' War. So it didn't work out so well, but she was a trusted confidant, and many thought that she was the de facto prime minister which also caused a lot of resentment from uh, the common class. Nevertheless, she she was a um, held a lot of sway, a lot of political influence, and did a lot to pr put France on a path that that changed its history. This is the Palace of Versailles, where she resided with the king. And uh, the Hall of Mirrors is on the very back of the building here. And this is one of, these, one of the architectural commissions she made. And um, she co commissioned a lot of other architecture too. During this time, there were sh small cottages and chateaus and, and other places that she commissioned and, and ensured that arts continued and had funding that it needed. The next few slides will show you Versailles and the Hall of Mirrors that she commissioned. The next few slides I've listed for you some of the most important women and their achievements during this period, and I will leave them for you to read at your leisure. A very strong and powerful woman during this time, Olympia de Gauge, she uh, went against the the right declaration of the rights of men and said, you know, uh, of mankind, but uh, that it only refers to men, not women, and women are always left out. So she was known as a revolutionary for women's rights during the French Revolution, uh, and she fought for equal liberties and. Um, she wrote letters to Marie Antoinette about how woman should, womanhood should be and how uh, women's natural light rights were lost and it was up to women to retrieve them. She believed that women needed to take a more active role in gaining and maintaining their rights and their status in society. 
And finally, we'll turn to Mary Wollstonecraft, and these are two portraits of her, painted by John Opie, who was her official portrait painter. Uh, she was a British writer and is considered one of the early, earliest feminists in Western history. During her lifetime, she wrote several novels, treatises, and other works of nonfiction. But of course, she is best known for A Vindication of the Rights of Women with strictures on political and moral subjects, which she wrote in 1792. In this uh, treatise or uh, book, it, it's really just a long essay. We'll talk about the form of it in a few minutes. But in, in it, she offers a response to the writings of 18th century theorists who argued that women should not receive a formal education. She viewed female education as an integral aspect of the advancement of society as a whole. Women, she said, were important in educating children and as a result, consequential in furthering the strength of the nation. She believed that women should receive a level of education that matched their social standing so that they could be both uh, ornamental figures and intellectual companions for their husbands. So you can see, she, even though she was advocating for equality, she did not uh, come as far as we think feminists uh, should and do today, where um, we shouldn't be ornamental figures at all. Uh, so she, she didn't lose that aspect, but she wanted to add to it intellectual companionship. So she didn't call for equal rights between men and women. She still maintained that women were naturally suited for lives as wives and mothers. Um, so today we look at her as a, a proto-feminist, uh, early feminist, but not necessarily uh, a feminist in terms of what we think of today. She's not a, a modern feminist because the concept of feminism did not even exist during her lifetime. Um, but she did maintain that women were human beings and thus were capable of thinking rationally and receiving a formal education. Uh, during this time, philosophers such as John Locke wrote on the principles and tenets of natural rights and Wollstonecraft built on Locke's beliefs and argued that natural rights such as life and liberty were given to humans by God and thus women possess these rights as well. So she was instrumental in building this, the foundation for future feminist writings. So I'll give you a little bit about her early life. We'll go through uh, some of her writing. Um, so she makes this powerful case for liberating and educating women. And at the same time, she was living out these theories. Uh, her book, Vindication of the Rights of Women, was uh, marks the emergence of the philosophical spirit and concept of the Enlightenment as society wants to move away from the authority of monarchy and move into a more democratic society. Well, the question of the rights of men uh, engendered lively debate at the time, a woman's lot remained unconsidered. So Wollstonecraft was the voice that came forward during this time. She was determined to change this and uh, add a dissenting female voice to the course of debating uh, political emancipation. She was the second child and oldest girl in a family of seven, but her childhood was very complicated. Uh, her family uh, went in a downward spiral. There, uh, her father was very violent and took them all over the country trying to work as a farmer, even though he had been trained as a weaver. And he, he was so miserable in his own lot in life that he took it out on his family. Um, there was, she had great envy of her older brother who was uh, singled out by her uh, wealthy grandfather in his will um, and, 
and Mary was left with nothing. So she had this, this severe envy of him that she wrote about in some of her, her works. Uh, when she was 19 in 1787, she left home to work as a lady's companion to a woman named Mrs. Dawson in, in Bath, England. Uh, she wanted a life alone with uh, her uh, friend, her best friend, though. What she really wanted was to live with her, with Fanny Blood. And she thought she would have a wonderful life with this friend, but she, it wasn't really acceptable at this time. And um, so they just worked together instead on an intellectual uh, foundation and um, her life was marked by a lot of family disasters during these years during her 20s and um, her mother became ill and so Mary had to return to London to nurse her through um, her illness which she eventually died from and then a few years later Mary faced the depression of her newly married sister Eliza um, she, so she was helping Eliza through a depression and it, she encouraged her to leave her unhappy marriage and, and her new baby. Um, but of course she was criticized for these opinions and um, she replied saying, and this is a quote, I knew I should be the shameful incendiary in this shocking affair of a woman leaving her husband, her bedfellow. To make up for her uh, issues with her family and moving around the country so much, she worked with uh, her sister Eliza, her best friend Fanny Blood, and a couple of other women and founded a small school in a progressive community uh, of people who were called dissenters, uh, who, people who were committed to combining reason with piety and who wanted a more egalitarian future based on individual effort. So she founded a school there and her, her sister, her best friend, they went through this great period of intellectual growth and broadened um, their worldview, but at the same time, it also broadened her resentment toward her family. And she worked that into an analysis of general social injustice. So she filtered her family tragedies into the greater good. She is very modern in many ways in that during all of these uh, family issues, she started writing um, and at the same time moving around um, at one point going to Scandinavia. She tried to commit suicide before she went. She tried to commit suicide again on the return um, and then she wrote about this in some letters like called Letters from Sweden in 1796 in which she talks about herself as a, a romantic unhappy wanderer in the midst of sublime nature and um, so she had very strong sensibilities both positive and negative she is very modern in that sense she's a self-assertive aggressive woman who suffered issues used them in her work tried to commit suicide recovered um, and all of this propelled her work forward large sections of the rights of women respond with great vitriol to uh, writers such as John Gregory and James Ferdis, but mostly to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who we looked at earlier in this lecture, who he wanted to deny women an education. Uh, and he argues that in Emile, women should be educated for the pleasure of men. So in attempting to navigate the cultural expectations of female writers and the generic conventions of political and philosophical discourse, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, constructs a unique blend of masculine and feminine styles in her, in her essay. She uses the language of philosophy and refers to her work as a treatise 
with arguments and principles. However, she uses a personal tone, employing I and you uh, instead of making it a distant third person. She uses dashes and exclamation marks, which uh, indicate emotion and aren't typically used in philosophical writings that are even kill. Uh, she uses autobiographical references that create a distinctly feminine voice in the text. So this even further hybridizes its genre by weaving together elements of the conduct book, the short essay, the novel, um, other these genres that are associated with women, but at the same time claiming that these genres could be used to discuss philosophical topics such as rights. Although she argues against excessive sensibility, the rhetoric of the rights of woman is at times heated and attempts to provoke the reader. Many of the most emotional comments in the book are directed directly at Rousseau. For example, after exerting a long passage from Emile, she pithily states, Quote, I shall make no other comments on this egregious passage than just to observe that it is the philosophy of lasciviousness. And then a page later, after indicating uh, or indicting Rousseau's plan for female education, she writes, quote, I must relieve myself by drawing another picture. These terse exclamations are meant to draw the reader to her side of the argument um, that, sh that they will then agree with her. While she claims to write in a plain style so that her ideas will reach the broadest possible audience, she actually combines the plain rational language of the political treatise with the poetic, passionate language of sensibility to demonstrate that one can combine rationality and sensibility at the same time. And then she defends her positions not only with reasoned argument, but also with ardent rhetoric. In her efforts to vividly describe the condition of women within society, Wollstonecraft employs several different analogies. She often compares women to slaves, arguing that their ignorance and powerlessness places them in that position. But at the same time, she also compares them to capricious tyrants who use cunning and deceit to manipulate the men around them. At one point, she reasons that a woman can become either a slave or a tyrant, which she describes as two sides of the same coin. Wollstonecraft also compares women to soldiers, like military men, they are valued only for their appearance. And like the rich woman's softness has debased mankind. I put this letter here just so you can have an example of, of Wollstonecraft's handwriting, so a letter written in, in her own hand. Um, just a little more about what she writes. Um, she doesn't make the claim for gender equality using the same arguments or language that we that we do today. Um, rather than unequivoc unequivocally stating that men and women are equal, she contends that men and women are equal in the eyes of God, which means that they are both subject to the same moral law. Um, men and women are equal in the most important areas of life she argues. Um, while such an idea may not seem revolutionary to us today, its implications were extremely revolutionary during the 18th century because it implied that both men and women, not just women, should be modest and respect the sanctity of marriage. Uh, Wollstonecraft's argument exposed the sexual double standard of the late 18th century and demanded that men adhere to the same virtues demanded of women. It argued for the need for civil rights for women, a cause which she believed could only be furthered by permitting women better education. She asserted that a woman was capable of any intellectual feat that a man was, 
provided that her early training did not brainwash her into deference to man. Wollstonecraft believed that women's freedom should extend to their sexual lives as well, and in her writings she compared married life, married life for a woman to prostitution. She pursued her own sexual freedom through an affair and had an Ill illegitimate child. Um, but the, she did later meet and fall in love with uh, William Godwin, the father of their second daughter. Um, tragically, she died in childbirth, delivering her second child, whose name is Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, who you may know as Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. So her daughter continues in her tradition. During her lifetime, Wollstonecraft raised arguments in support of women's rights that would figure prominently in the women's rights movements of the following two centuries. Her work in pursuit of equality for women led her to being dubbed the founder of the British women's rights movement. On this page, I give you the link to Vindication of the Rights of Women, so you can read it at, at your leisure. You can get it on the Project Gutenberg, or you can get a slightly abbreviated version at the second link on the page. And here I've posted the images from the abbreviated version that has a glossary in it, so you can understand the terminology, because even though the words are the same that we use today, the meanings are nuanced. There are some slightly different uh, ways of thinking about these words in the 18th century than there are today. And this concludes the lecture for uh, Enlightenment Women. Uh, you will see on the next few pages just some notes that I left for you uh, concerning Wollstonecraft's argumentation. And we will move on to the 19th century.